and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be exploring the tragic murder of 20-year-old Deborah Wood from Leeds in 1996. Her murder was violent and the lengths that the killer went to cover up the crime caused huge concern for West Yorkshire police. Her murder is still unsolved and her family desperately want more answers to what happened. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. On January the 14th, 1996, a fire was reported to emergency services in the West Yorkshire village of Burley, around 11 miles northwest from the city of Leeds. The passers-by noticed the fire at Burley train station and becoming worried about it spreading, they made the emergency call. Firefighters immediately went out to the scene to investigate the situation and to put out the flames. When they arrived, they weren't prepared for what they were about to see. When the flames were extinguished, what they found was a horrific sight. The charred body of a woman who had been set alight was the source of the fire and nobody could have been expecting such a terrible cause. The scene was now quite rightly a crime scene, and West Yorkshire police were now involved. The woman's body was damaged to the extent that her features and any distinguishing marks were not able to be discerned or identified. The police had just a few details to work with, namely evidence of her clothing, red fingerless gloves, a beige skirt and boots. This wasn't a lot to go on, however it was the only indication that they had. Why was this woman at the train station? Why had she become the victim of a crime? And who was she? Someone did recognise the clothing and had come to a horrific conclusion. Linda Vernon heard the news about the body that had been found on TV. She was immediately concerned by it. When she heard about the clothing that the woman had been found in, she was sure that her fears were right and her heart sank. She rang the police and told them, That's my lass. She would later say, I knew it was our Deborah. Linda had recognised the small pieces of clothing that had been recovered. She later told the press, They said there were only bits of clothes left, red fingerless gloves, boots and a skirt. I knew then. Joanne, her sister, had given her the gloves and I'd bought her the beige skirt. Linda had become concerned about her 20-year-old daughter Deborah Wood when she had had plans to meet up with her and go shopping in the market town of Morley in the borough of Leeds. Deborah hadn't turned up to meet her and Linda knew that this was unusual. Linda would later explain that Deborah had recently moved out of the family home in Wakefield and into her own flat in Leeds. Linda stated that Deborah was the baby of the family, having grown up with two older sisters and a brother. So Deborah moving out was a big deal for her and her family. Deborah seemed to be happy with the move though and continued to keep in contact with her family and meet up with them often. It was normal for her to meet up with her mum and do a bit of shopping, and so when Linda turned up but Deborah didn't, this rang alarm bells. Linda explained, We were supposed to meet outside the town hall in Morley. I remember it was freezing cold and foggy. I waited for more than three hours, but she never turned up. This was highly unusual and out of character, and it made Linda immediately worried. The fact that the worst imaginable was now reality when Deborah's body was recovered must have been horrendous. And also the fact that Linda had found this out on a TV report is such a tragedy. Now that police had an identification, they began trying to establish Deborah's last known movements as well as sending her body for analysis. They discovered that Deborah seemed to have last been seen 10 days before her body was recovered. She had met her dad for drinks at Big Lil's public house in Leeds city centre on the 4th of January. 
Deborah left at around 5pm that evening and this appeared to be the last time that anyone had seen her alive. Where had she been during this time and what had happened to her when she left? These were the questions that police were hoping to get some answers to through the analysis of Deborah's body. Her body had undergone an awful lot of damage due to the fire and it was confirmed that it had been doused with petrol before being set alight. This damage made a cause of death very difficult to establish. One thing that the forensic examiners did find was both shocking and surprising. Forensic evidence that was recovered suggested that before her body was set alight, it seemed to have been kept in cold storage, and this was thought to have been for up to 10 days. This news was alarming and completely fit the theory that whatever had happened to Deborah was definitively a murder. It also raised some questions. Why had someone murdered her and kept her in cold storage before setting her alight? Where had they done this? When had they done this? Given there were only 10 days between Deborah going missing and her body being recovered, there was a very narrow window when this could have occurred, and suggested that someone had done her harm not long after she had disappeared. Police began looking at all angles of the investigation, trying to take into account all of the possible things that could have happened to Deborah. But given there wasn't a lot of forensic evidence, or witnesses placing anyone specific at the scene, it was proving difficult. They appealed for information and for anyone to come forward to help. The police were optimistic that the appeal would bring forward important information, and Deborah's case was featured on Crime Watch at the end of March 1996. This gave the case a much-needed public platform, and this was a step in the right direction for the investigation. Unfortunately, despite this national attention, few leads came in that were relevant to Deborah's case, or identified a possible suspect. This was, of course, disappointing, and as time went by, Deborah's family were left wondering who had committed this awful murder and why. There were things that just didn't make sense to her family. Why was she in that area in the first place? Deborah's brother Craig would later confirm that she had no links to the area in which her body was found, and there was no reason why she would have been there. Deborah had been behaving like her usual self, and there was no indication that anything was wrong during that last time that she was seen in Leeds. What had happened and how Deborah had become the victim of such a brutal crime was a real mystery. Something that remained a mystery for the police was that Deborah's body had been kept in cold storage for up to 10 days before her body was then set on fire. Why had someone done this? Where had she been kept? And why had her body been left where it was in that location? There were features of the case that didn't make sense, and they had little information to answer any of them. Deborah's case began to grow cold when information and evidence wasn't forthcoming, and there were no immediate breaks in the case. The year 2000 came around, and Deborah's family were still waiting for answers. However, another tragic murder would soon make connections that nobody was expecting. On the 20th of August 2001, the body of 16-year-old Leanne Tiernan was discovered close to Otley, on the border between North and West Yorkshire. Leanne had been missing since the previous November, after she'd been on a shopping trip with her friend in Leeds, and was on her way back to her house in Bramley when she suddenly vanished. When her friend Sarah arrived home, she rang Leanne's house, but was shocked to find that she wasn't there. She hadn't arrived back. Leanne's family were immediately worried and phoned the police to report her missing. The investigation into Leanne's disappearance was large, with Detective Superintendent Chris Gregg in charge of the missing person inquiry. 
Thousands of house-to-house -house inquiries were made, along with searches of the area where she'd last known to be seen. Some DNA samples were taken from local men in the area, and Leanne's face was printed on the side of milk cartons. As the months passed though, Leanne had not been found, until nine months later by someone walking their dogs. The fact that Leanne's body had been found in that location was also quite concerning, given that just around a hundred yards from where she'd been found, another woman's body had also been discovered. Yvonne Fitt was just 32 years old when her body was found in a shallow grave in September of 1992, close to where Leanne Tiernan had now been found. Yvonne had an 11-year-old daughter and had been working as a sex worker in the red light districts of Bradford and Leeds at the time that she had been murdered, and she'd last been seen in January of that year in Bradford. When her decomposing body was analysed, it was discovered that she had been stabbed to death and that her body transported, either dead or alive, to the location where it was eventually found. It was thought that this had occurred in around July of 1992, two months before she was found. Yvonne's murder had been featured on Crime Watch and there was an anonymous caller who phoned into the show in November of 1992 with the name of a possible suspect. This caller was not able to be traced. Yvonne's family were distraught by the news that she had been found murdered and described her as being left without any dignity. Despite the publicity that Yvonne's case received at the time, her case grew cold, without any real suspects or evidence to identify who was responsible for the murder. When Leanne's body was found very close to where Yvonne's had been, the police were concerned about what exactly they were dealing with. There didn't appear to be any tangible links between the two cases, given that almost ten years had passed and the two women were very different as victims, but the proximity was both strange and problematic. Leanne's body was taken to be analysed and the way in which she was concealed was looked at closely. Her body had been wrapped in green plastic bin liners, which were then tied with twine. Her head had also been wrapped in a black bin liner, which was held in place with a dog collar. Her hands had been tied together with cable ties, and there were also cable ties around her neck with a scarf. Her body was then finally wrapped in a floral duvet cover. The postmortem brought up something strange. Leanne had been missing for nine months, but her body was inconsistent with this, leading forensic experts to believe that her body may have been kept in cold storage or in a freezer for some period of time. This meant that the decomposition was not as severe as it may have been if this hadn't been the case. This, in a way, would help the investigation later on. During the inquiries in Leanne's murder, a name was given to police by two separate people who had once dated the same man, John Taylor. Taylor lived on the same housing estate as Leanne and had bragged to both of these women when passing the woods where Leanne was found that he often went poaching there. Taylor often went hunting and poaching and was known to be cruel and violent towards animals. When police investigated Taylor, they found that he often put adverts in Lonely Heart columns after his wife had divorced him in 1996, and these women that he met up with told officers that he had a bondage fetish. He would regularly tie up women with cable ties, and this made many of the women uncomfortable. When Taylor's house was searched, they found other items that linked him to the crime, and they ended up with a wealth of forensic evidence against him. Scientists were able to use mitochondrial DNA testing to match a hair found wrapped in the knot of the scarf around Leanne's neck to Taylor. They also found the twine that had been used to wrap the body up was usually only used by the Ministry of Defence, but a small batch had been sold for nets to catch rabbits in. This batch matched the twine used at the scene and was also found in Taylor's home. 
Red carpet fibres were also found on Leanne's clothing, and when Taylor's home was searched, it was discovered that he had removed a lot of the carpet and burnt it. But nails in the floorboards still had some carpet attached, and this was a match to the fibres found on Leanne's body. Pollen analysis of Leanne's body also showed that she had been in Taylor's garden not long before she had died, as distinctive types of pollen was found in Leanne's nasal cavity. There was no getting around it. John Taylor was responsible for Leanne Tiernan's murder. He was convicted of Leanne's murder in 2002 and was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term set in 2006 of 30 years. Police began to believe that Taylor had been involved in other crimes before, with Detective Superintendent Chris Gregg stating that they do not believe that this was the first major crime he had committed. In fact, they used his DNA profile to match him to two sexual assaults in the 1980s. One occurred in 1988 when he attacked a 32-year-old woman wearing a mask and a knife as she was walking across some waste ground in Leeds. He raped this woman and then let her go. In 1989, he broke into a 21-year-old woman's house in Bramley in Leeds at lunchtime. He blindfolded and gagged her and then raped her. Her baby was in the other room at the time of these attacks. These were brutal attacks with a clear sexual motive and in 2003 he pled guilty to the two attacks. He was later charged with 16 other offences in 2018 including another three rapes between 1977 and 1996. These were all discovered through DNA testing. The judge stated, You carried out a 20-year campaign of rape and assaults, fueled by sadistic desire to inflict pain for sexual gratification. John Taylor was clearly a sexual predator and killer, and therefore it was no surprise that the police wanted to check if he had been involved in any other possible murders. One of them that stood out was the murder of Deborah Wood in 1996. Deborah's case began to be talked about in relation to John Taylor for several reasons. One of the main things that made a connection between the two was the fact that Leanne Tiernan's body had been kept in cold storage before being buried in a shallow grave. This odd and distinctive fact was also the same as Deborah's, whose body was kept frozen before later being set alight. There was also the fact that the area where Deborah's body was found was only around a 12-minute walk away from John Taylor's home in the area of Bramley. The suspicion that Taylor had something to do with the murder is at this moment still a suspicion, as forensic evidence is yet to conclude whether he had anything to do with it. Taylor is being looked at for several unsolved murders in the area, including that of Yvonne Fitt, the 1995 murder of Lindsay Jo Reimer, who disappeared from Hebden Bridge, and whose case we've covered previously on the podcast, and the 1991 murder of Donna Healy from Bradford, whose body also appeared to have been frozen before being dumped. Deborah's family believe that Taylor did have something to do with Deborah's murder and hope that this can be confirmed so that they can finally get some justice or closure. Craig Wood, Deborah's brother, told The Mirror in 2019, I really believe he killed my sister and I'm going to write to him and ask him to see me. There's far too many coincidences. The police told us she was dumped in a blanket and wrapped in bin bags like his other victim. It also said in the coroner's report that she was kept in cold storage. And why would she be in that area? She had no links there, and Taylor only lived a short walk away. He's not getting out now, so he should admit to this crime. If I saw him, I'd say, you've had a bad life, and it's time to come clean. You've caused so much misery for all these years. He needs to let people like me and my mum and our family get some peace while we're still alive. Deborah's mum, Linda, also stated, I want him to put me out of my misery before I go. I'm sure it was him. 
When I saw his eyes, they sent chills through me. I want to see him face to face and just ask him, tell me the truth. This has been 23 years of hurt. I can't describe the pain. At this moment, there is nothing concrete linking Taylor to the other murders, and they're still unsolved. Police have to, of course, keep an open mind about what could have happened to Deborah, and there may be many other people out there who are possible suspects and could be responsible for her murder. In 2021, Detective Inspector Paul Conroy from West Yorkshire's Operation Recall team appealed for information about Deborah's murder, saying, This crime may now be 25 years old, but time doesn't diminish our resolve to bring the person or persons responsible for this horrendous crime to justice. And likewise, her grieving family want answers about what happened to Deborah. I would appeal to anyone who knows anything about this case to examine the conscience and come forward. Your information could make all the difference. Deborah was given no dignity in death, with her body being burned to the extent that she was only identified using dental records and DNA. Previous attempts to bring her killer to justice, including an appeal and reconstruction on BBC's Crime Watch, have so far failed. Hopefully, with the passage of time, people may feel more comfortable or able to come forward and tell us what happened. As with all unsolved murder inquiries, the case remains under investigation and a thorough forensic review remains ongoing. This is where Deborah's case is at the moment, with appeals still being made by the police to try and track down Deborah's killer. It's tragic that all of these years later, we still do not know who did this to her, and this is the same for Yvonne Fitt, Donna Healy and Lindsay Jo Reimer, who are often spoken about together. Was this the work of one person? Are any of these crimes connected? We don't know, and police have certainly not officially connected any of them. I'm sure there's a lot of work happening behind the scenes on DNA profiling and matching and this may well eventually crack the case. However, it could also be cracked by someone coming forward with any information that they have. If you know anything about Deborah, Yvonne, Lindsay or Donna's murders, then please contact West Yorkshire Police on 101. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you'd like to support the podcast further, then you can on Patreon and contribute to the exclusive polls to get extra bonus episodes every month. You can also get access to new episodes early and ad-free. You can use the link in the show notes to visit Patreon. You can also support us by reviewing the podcast wherever you listen, including Spotify, and also just share the episodes. You can subscribe on YouTube and follow us on social media. You can now also subscribe and listen to my new podcast, 10 Minute True Crime, which tells infamous crimes in a short form, bite-sized, 10 minutes, for people on the go or who just like the facts. Find that wherever you listen and in the show notes. As always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.